My name's Larry Smith. Um, I've been saved 25 years, roughly. Um, I got saved when I was about 32 years old. Yep, go ahead. And uh, as soon as I got saved, I knew God put me here to share the gospel. The first Bible verse I ever memorized, he gave me just right away, was Acts 17, 47. You know, uh, so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I've set thee to be a light unto the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. I don't know why, but that just jumped off the page. It's like, God's telling me to know this. And so um, early on, I was at KCBT, um, got discipled, went through D2. As I was in, being discipled, we started an evangelism ministry where we took telescopes out to, out to schools, grade schools, and set them up and taught uh, the gospel in the stars. And that was kind of my start. And we got to talk to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And that's something I can tell all of you. With a little bit of practice, the nerves go away, the fright goes away, it gets very, very easy. You really have to ask yourself a question. Who am I here to please? Somebody out there or God? Evangelism is one third of the Great Commission. You know, he has, you know, when he says, go ye therefore and teach, if you look up the Greek word for the first teach, it's evangelize. And then teaching all things, the next one's disciple. And under the ends of the earth is missions. You can't be a Christian if you're going to ignore a third of the duty. And think how many people we come into contact with every day. Um, I, I had a, a gentleman named Leo Humphrey that was a great, great evangelist, particularly in Central America. He'd go down there many, many times a year. He'd lead people down there. It was a time that especially El Salvador was, you could stand on the street corner like out here and hold up the Bible and start preaching and you draw a hundred people around you and you give the gospel and a very large number get saved. It was just a revival at that time. Even at a time when they'd just gone through a horrible war and this country was a mess and politics were a mess, God was moving there like, like we've seen very few places on earth. Um, but Leo taught me the most important thing I've ever learned for evangelism. And he said, Larry, don't go evangelize. Don't just do that once a week, like some of you said. Evangelize as you go. Everywhere you go, share the gospel. Leo said, if I, if I have to go to the hardware store for something, it's because somebody there needs the gospel. If he sends me to the gas station, somebody there needs the gospel. If I go out to eat, somebody there needs a the gospel. And Leo's a guy that would literally walk into a restaurant and hand tracks to every single person in the restaurant, including the cooks in the back before he'd sit down. That is not an exaggeration. So that's our duty. God also says, the fields are white already for harvest. And it also says, pray for workers of the harvest. He's already prepared hearts. So confrontational evangelism is a numbers game. If you give the gospel to one person, maybe one person will get saved. But if only one out of 10 gets saved, you only got a one in 10 chance. If you give the gospel to 10 people, probably somebody's going to get saved. If you give the gospel to 100 people, it's 10, right? Some hearts are already prepared. You haven't done anything to prepare those hearts. God has. Um, I've got something I should have printed out for you guys, but you can look at this. You can even pass it around. The steps to salvation are you start off with people that have no awareness of God, and you can talk to them and explain who is Jesus. And I've literally met people who don't have a clue who Jesus was at all. One of the ministries I was in was a, an evangelism ministry in a juvenile detention center that we did for 25 years, Johnson County Juvenile Detention Center. We'd go once a week and we'd play basketball for 45 minutes and then Bible study for 45 minutes. And we had hundreds and hundreds of kids come to Christ in that over the years. But we ran into kids there that absolutely didn't know the name Jesus or what it was. They kind of heard a rumor but had no clue. The next is some awareness of God. The next is contact with Christians, interest in Jesus Christ, deciding to investigate Jesus Christ. Some that start grasping the truth, saying, okay, he, he, he is maybe the savior of the world. Then they understand the implications and then the acceptance of, of the truth and the acceptance of what that means for them. And then finally, salvation. 
a lot of the people you talk to, you're simply moving up those steps of the ladder. Never, ever, ever share the gospel with somebody and the, just because they don't pray think you failed or that it wasn't good. You may have moved them from step one to step nine and the next time they hear it, they're saved. Also don't think, well, I'm not evangel an evangelist. I'm not supposed to do this. Paul told Timothy, the greatest evangelist in the world, told his disciple, go do the work of the evangelist. Because he had to be prompted to do it. An evangelist is somebody that can move people up more steps at a time. That's all it comes down to. It's a spiritual gift. All of us should be moving people up the steps. Some are at step eight or nine and ready to go over the top at any given time. So our duty as Christians, a third of the Great Commission, is to share the gospel. And think how many thousands of people we come face to face with in a year. I mean, I share the gospel a lot and I'm constantly crushed by the number of people I missed. Think about it. Think how many people you miss that you're going to see judged in heaven and thrown to hell because nobody ever told them the gospel. So our duty is to share. So what is it that we share? When we go out and do confrontational evangelism, what you want to do is, is greet people in, in some very friendly way, very open way, some way that's not putting them off. And then I try to get to the gospel pretty quickly. I don't really want to spend 10 minutes learning their kids and dogs' name and everything else in the world and then find out, oh, nah, I don't believe that. Because I could have given the gospel to four or five other people in that time maybe, right? So you don't want to waste a lot of time. You want to get to the point. You want to be honest. Some people have said, oh, we're going to go out and do surveys and see if anybody might be interested in hearing the gospel. That's baloney. God doesn't say go do surveys. What's he say? Share the gospel. I think it was D.L. Moody, one of the great evangelists of all time. He said, why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone's heard it once? Think about that. If you get somebody that's not ready, do what you can. Teach them what you can. Try to move them up as many steps as they're willing to move up and then move on. That's our job. So what's that look like? I usually walk up to people and ask them, you know, are you sure you're right with God? Are you sure you're going to heaven? You know, you can, and I usually hand them a track because I don't, I want them to see what God is writ, has written to them. I don't want them to care what some old dude walking up on the street has to say. It's what did God say? So you always want to put it in a position of God said this to you, not my church, not my pastor. You get into that argument. They're going to talk about their church. They're going to talk about their priest or pastor or what unfruitful. What does God say? So you always want to be the advocate in the middle trying to help them to God. You don't want to be, as many are, the Holy Spirit and trying to condemn them and beat them into accepting Christ. That doesn't work. It's not friendly. It's not our job. I always want to take the position of, man, I got saved from, from hell and I want to help you to do the same. I want to help you to know God. I'm a sinner. As I run through the, the things, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm just as guilty as you. I wanted them to, to say, hey, this guy's here trying to help me, not try to condemn me and beat me into submission. So you want to be just as friendly as you can. Ask them, hey, are you sure? And a large number of people in America think so. You're going to get answers if you go out. If you go and talk to 10 people, you're probably going to get one or two complete blow-offs. No, I don't care. And that number has been growing over the years I've been doing this. The world is becoming more and more polarized. You're going to get a bunch that say no, or I think so, or yes, and always ask the next question. I was a Catholic brought up. My mom died when I was in college. I stopped going to church. But I thought I was okay with God. I knew who Jesus was. I knew who God was. I respected him. I was certainly a sinner, especially in my college years, unsaved, doing all the crazy stuff that everybody does. So it, when somebody comes and says, are you sure you're going to heaven? I'm thinking, well, of course I am. I was baptized. They wouldn't ask the next question. I always say, are you sure you're going to heaven? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Oh, that's wonderful. How do you know? Oh, okay. You're baptized. Is, is, does getting baptized pay for all the sins you've committed? 
So you just start asking questions, just probing. The first verse we put in our tract shows that you can know for sure, because so many people don't know for sure. I didn't know. You can all grab a tract, take a look at it. I use this tract almost all the time that I'm out sharing the gospel. A friend of mine and I wrote this about, I don't know, 18 years ago, 20 years ago. He owned a printing company. He was very artistic. And he and I just kind of put it together. And it's just the way that I share the gospel. So you start off, do you know for sure? Well, look, it says you can know. Do you want to know? And there's some people that say no, but most people say, yeah. And he's like, Everybody wants to go, right? The question's how, not if. It's a dumb question. Do you want to go to heaven and have eternity with God and everything good? Or do you want to burn in hell forever? I mean, it's a simple choice. And they ask, okay, why isn't it automatic? Why isn't it automatic that we go to heaven? God wants you there. You want to go. Why isn't it automatic? Yeah, free will. There's this little thing called sin. And when you stand before God and he says, have you ever told a lie? How do you plead? Innocent or guilty? How many times? Oh, me too, man. My, uh, my stack's this big. You know, get on their side. Yeah, me too. Have you ever disobeyed your mom? How many times? Too much. <laughs> Have you ever looked at a girl and thought things you shouldn't think unless you're married to her? So you just, and you show them their sin. You can't get saved if you don't know what you're getting saved from. And especially in this age of, of the Joel Osteen TV evangelists, oh, God is love. Just say this little prayer and you go to heaven. No. That does not work. You have to know what you're being saved from, and you have to be sorry for it and turn from it. I'll show you more of that later. Some people are very visual. So we put the pictures in here. Billy Graham had a track that had pictures kind of like this, kind of cheesy little stick drawings. Brent did some really cool, cool drawings. Brent's now a pastor down south of town, if any of you know him. Cool guy, smart guy. And then you say, okay, if... So we know we're sinners. We know we've sinned hundreds of thousands of times. So nobody's going to start thinking, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm good. Oh, are you good? No. So look what it says. All liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Ooh, I don't want to go there. Do you? Nor thieves shall inherit the kingdom of God. Hmm. And then look at the bridges there. You say, now some people try to do good works. They know in their heart they're sinners. They know in their heart that they've done wrong. So they try to make up for it. They try to do good works. But does that make you less guilty of the sins you've committed? They try religion. Oh, does going to this building or that building take away the sins that you've already committed so you're not guilty when you're judged? You just kind of go through it. Then you get to, there is a way that seem right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And you can watch their body language. And you should, this should be a two-way dialogue. You're learning about them. I, I witnessed the Catholics, the, the works-based group, Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopals, that group, differently than I do just complete lost people, and certainly differently than I do Hindus, Buddhists, anything like that. But you kind of want to know where they are. But right here, there's a way that seems right in a man. The end there is the ways of death. But you'll see people who are kind of cheerful and friendly at first. And they're going to have their head kind of down. They're going to be like, oh, this is bad. That's conviction. That's God talking to them. You want to see that. You don't want to beat them into it. You want to expose them to it so that God can do his work. And then I say, but you want to know the good news? Incredibly good news? Look what it says right here. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And I even hold my hands out and say, it's a gift. Do you want it? Do you want this gift? You want the gift of going to heaven? God's holding it out to you like this. Do you want it? And most people are going to say, yeah, if you get that far. You go to the next page. You want to really show them God's love and that he is the payment for their sins. Again, you can't get saved if you don't know who the Savior is. So we go through some of these verses. And don't think if you've got a tract in your hand, you have to read every one. I don't, ever. But you want to pick the ones that you think are going to work best for them. And you want to let them read along with you. You ought to know these so well, whatever track you use. This one's great, but we, there's many. 
but you want to show them God's word and let them read it. You need to know it well enough you can do it upside down. You ought to have these memorized. So I say, look, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. It's not what we do, it's what he did. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wages, the pay for our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's holding it back. He's holding it out to you again. You want that gift? The, cro the cross is the bridge back. The cross is the only way. Jesus Christ made payments so you don't have to. And sometimes I use silly examples if they're, if they're kind of looking at you funny. I go, you know, you go out here on, on the highway and you drive 100 miles an hour and get a ticket. You're going to get a $500 fine. And when the judge says you owe 500 bucks, he doesn't care whether you pay it, I pay it, or your mom pays it. Somebody's paying it, right? God's the same way. Somebody's going to pay for your sin, either Jesus Christ or you. And unfortunately, he's an eternal being who can make an eternal payment. You aren't. You're never done. And it's awful hot there. And you kind of joke around with them. Keep it light. Keep it friendly. But continue to go. And you kind of have to read their, their thoughts. You have to read their body language. You can ask questions. You know, are you understanding this? Do you understand what it means to make a payment for your sin? You know, you can do that. And then you show, then you go to the, the final steps. And I usually go to as many as received him to them. He gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I look him square in the eye and I said, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And many, many will say yes. Some will say, I'm not sure. That's okay. You moved them up the ladder. They're not to faith yet, but now they got the story and they got conviction. Okay? Some will say no. And it's disappointing because you're hoping they're going to get saved, right? But they get to their, oh, I'm not sure. But some say, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Do you believe he died on the cross to pay for your sins? Yes. And was buried. Yes. That's faith. Right? So now you've got faith. Are they saved yet? They confessed with their mouth that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again. So if in their heart they're convicted of their sin, maybe. But that's not the end yet. Right? Or the Bible wouldn't have included more verses about it. Romans 10 says, okay, with that faith, here's what God tells you to do. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, what's that? That's a prayer. And shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, what's that? Faith. And then I make them read the last four words. What's it say? Thou shall be saved. Does it say maybe? Does it say might? Does it say if you walk little old ladies across the street or give money to church? What's it say to do? Confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. Now, are we done there? Nope. Because they don't understand what they're doing yet. And you have to explain it. And many people, even good, good Christians, don't do this very well. What are you confessing with your mouth? You can answer. It's right there in the verse. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. What's that mean? When you're sinning, you're off on your own, you're the Lord of your life, you're doing your own thing. How does that make God the Father feel? He made you, he gave you every bite of food you ever ate, every breath you ever breathed, every good thing you ever had, and here you are over and over and over sinning. But what you're confessing here is you're going to put him back on the throne. You're going to follow him. And that's the commitment that they are making to God. That is repentance. I was going this way, and now I'm coming this way. I'm going to do the best I can. I mean, say, you know, I've got kids. Do I expect my kids to be perfect? No. But do I expect them to try to follow me and do what I say? Absolutely. That's our loving God. When you're out sinning, when you're out doing drugs, sex, rock and roll, all that other crazy stuff, you're running from God in his ways. He's not your Lord. 
But you've got to explain to them what lordship is. And then really drill in, and I'm learning this even more and more after all the times I've done it. It's getting harder and harder for people to really see what sin is and turn from it. People used to think a much more black and white way. You know, 200 years ago, sin it was sin and not sin, and everybody knew the difference. Now we're so blurred and blended and what is and what isn't. People will be saying, yeah, I want to get saved, and they're still going to go home and sleep with their girlfriend. And thinking it's okay. I mean, they're going to go out and get drunk after they're done talking to you. You know, you have to really can show them the need to turn from sin. And it takes a while. And God's just got to show them in their heart that they're sinners and they need to repent. Now, are they going to be perfect and leave all sin behind and never sin again? Never? Um, no. Disciples take a while to get away from that. They have to have a heart to follow God. Isn't that what you guys did when you got saved? Were you perfect the day you got saved? No sin anymore? No bad habits? None of the stuff you... Wasn't that all gone by then? But God cleans us up, doesn't he? And he continues to show us. So this verse is critical that you show lordship and what it means to really turn from your sin and accept Christ. And then I say, okay, if you want to accept Christ... Are you sorry for your sins? Yes, okay. All we have to do is pray this little verse back to him, back to God, and you can be saved. Do you want to do that? And then I lead them. And I just say, you know, okay, pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, and they say, dear Lord, you know, I'm sorry for my sins. I accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What's in the verse? Who died on the cross, was buried, and rose again to pay for my sins. And I ask you to save me. And then I really challenge them. I say, if you really meant that, you are saved. But if not, you still need to be thinking about this and pray. If your heart isn't fully in it, God isn't either. But if you really meant it, now when you get to heaven, turn back to the first verse. This verse is yours. It's a promise. You will go to heaven. You have eternal life, but you're not going to be judged for your sins. Your sins are wiped away and paid for. But I always point them out to the next step. But when you get to heaven and God says, remember when you talked to that dude out on the street here in front of Kim Lynn and you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior? God's going to say, what did you do with your life from then until now? Because there's rewards if you serve me. And there's shame if you don't. So I flip them right there from a focus on sin to service and make them know that there is a responsibility. You don't want to just turn them loose and think they're happy and can go live their life happily ever after. We want them in a church. We want them serving God. We want them to know that there's a purpose and a reason for that. And then absolutely invite them to your Bible study, invite them to church, whatever works, invite them out to lunch. You know, hey, you want to meet for lunch next week and, and talk about this some more. And many of the people that prayed really, really mean it. Some you'll meet later on and you're not sure. I mean, we had some kids up in Wyoming a couple weeks ago. We had like uh, six college students that intently listened. And I know some of them seemed extremely sincere, but we talked to one of them later on and he probably didn't get the repentance part of it completely. So you can't do that. Nowhere in the Bible, by the way, is there a warning not to lead people to the Lord if you're not sure or if they're not sure. Nowhere in the Bible does it not say to pray with somebody because you're scared they might not be ready. That's between them and God. You can't know their heart. Nobody knew when I got saved. I did it at home all by myself. After hearing the gospel over and over and over, God finally showed me the truth and opened my eyes. Nothing tells you not to lead people to the Lord, and everything tells you to try. And I, I actually have the belief that if people really sincerely hear all of this and pray and ask God, if their heart isn't right yet, if they're not sure about repentance, I think God's going to show them in, in their life. You know, you've just, they're on step nine teetering to the top. Don't you think God in his mercy is going to show them? Because you in a 10-minute conversation can't know. So our duty is to share. 
It's easy. We have things like this that you can use. And I've done this literally tens of thousands of times. I still use the track and I use it to show them. It also keeps me on track. You will experience, I mean, the minute you get to that Romans 10 section, their cell phone's gonna ring. The bus is gonna come if you're at the bus stop. The, I mean, just expect, expect interruptions. Expect, you know, there to be things that are, you know, a, a distraction. That's when the baby in the stroller is gonna start screaming its head off. Just step back and rest, wait a minute. See, you know, if they're literally getting on a bus, say, okay, here's the prayer. If you wanna pray, read all the way through this. Make sure you do that right now because Satan will try to take it away from you. You know, you will get interrupted. Just expect that at times, but there's other times that it's just phenomenal. That's how I do it. And you can do the exact same kind of message in front of this many people or one. You know, you can you can stand up on, you know, on the altar at church, the, the platform at church, and and give the gospel the same way you do to one person out on the street if you if you learn how to do the steps. It's that easy. Any questions? Yeah, what, what's the difference between witnessing to a family member and somebody that's out on the street? A family member or a best friend or a roommate or even a classmate is somebody you've got an ongoing relationship with. And that is something that you're very likely to have more than one chance to share the gospel. Um, so you can kind of, you want to give them the gospel, but you don't have to be as immediate about it, as harsh about it, as as direct as you do somebody that you're never going to see again. You know, we go out on the street tonight. We're going to talk to people that you probably won't ever see again. Well, you want to give them the whole story. You know, if it's your mom, you can say, hey, my mom, you know, you, I've got saved. You've seen what's happened. You know, I'd, I'd love to share with you and give them as much as they're willing to take, but build it over time. And it's just like people, you know, lots of people you invite into your Bible study. You don't hammer them the first night. You want them to hear the gospel so it can work. And that's something I always do, especially when we get to that Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 verse. I, any gospel message, I want to give them the death, burial, resurrection more than once. And I don't want that to just be at the end. My Bible tells me that is the power of God. I don't want that to be the last thing they hear before they've made up their mind and then they leave. Right? So my gospel messages, if you ever hear me preach, I almost always get the gospel in early and late because it's the power that's what saves leo humphrey said he did a he used to live in louisiana he'd go down to mardi gras and get pastors down there and teach them how to share the gospel and he said this one time this one guy they were going out into the mardi gras crowds and sharing the gospel and there's like 24 pastors there this one poor guy kept coming back and goes nothing is happening i don't know what is going on all these other guys are coming back. Oh, yeah, I had five people make professions. I had six, I had two, I had one, whatever. This guy's, it's just not working. Leo looked at him and said, well, well, go through it with me. Tell me what you're thinking. And he says, I go up to him and I ask him, you know, do you want to go to heaven? Are you, are you sure you, you belong in heaven? And I said, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Do you believe that? And Leo's like, no, 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 no. The power of the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You're only preaching a third of the message. The guy went out sharing the whole gospel and people got saved. I've never forgotten that. Now, that doesn't mean every time you are explaining to somebody you have to go through the whole thing. You know, you may talk about Christ dying for your sins two or three times in a gospel presentation. You don't have to go through the whole thing every single time. And especially if you're preaching somewhere. You know, if you get to go preach you know, at a at a some kind of outreach event or something like that, you know, you can say Christ died for your sins. But you want to get that death, burial, resurrection in early and late is is what I've seen God use. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Don't have to be as forceful, don't have to, you know, out on the street, they're gonna hear it maybe once in their life. You want to be sure they heard it all. 
if you can. And if they're receptive. Now, you get people whose body language is like, you know, say, you can just give them a track and say, here, read this when you get home. You know, don't, don't try to force people to listen to you who really don't want to and are just being polite. Because you're wasting their time and they're wasting yours. Also, you get out on the street, you will find religious people who want to debate with you, especially Jehovah Witnesses and people like that. Talk to them long enough they get the gospel. Talk to them long enough that you're friendly. But don't waste your whole day. If you've got two hours to share the gospel and you're going to spend 45 minutes with a guy who's never going to hear it, that's dumb, right? And I've even, around Midtown, when we've gone out to do Hit the Streets, I mean, one time I can vividly remember, this guy wanted to debate, 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 debate. And after about 15 minutes, I finally, and, and we had like three or four people around, I just finally said, well, we have to go, sorry, see ya. And I turned my back on him and walked away. And he's still talking. But it's like, no, there are other souls out there that need to be saved today. Or at least need to be moved up those steps. You know, I'm not going to spend all day with somebody who's got a closed heart right now. I pray he gets saved. He heard the message. But I'm not going to sit there and argue with a Jehovah Witness all afternoon and nobody else hear the gospel. But witnesses you go. Every time I go to a restaurant and sign the check, I throw a tract in with the check. Often when I go to cashiers, you know, checking out of the grocery store or things, I'll say, here, get, get, you know, read this on your break. You know, I, I had a gal at Sam's Club one time, like super busy Saturday afternoon, six people in every line. I said, here, are, are you sure you're going to heaven? I'll, I'll give you something you can read on your break. This gal took the track and, and stepped back from her cash register and just locked in like this. I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna get her fired, but maybe she'll go to heaven. She was ready. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 on your break. <laughs> she was ready for it. And you'll find people like that. You'll find people on the street, you know, you know, almost what must I do to be saved? On the way up to Wyoming, there was this uh, subway and we stopped to get sandwiches. And there were some people just kind of sitting around by themselves, you know, people driving across I-80 by themselves, eating sandwiches. And I just gave some tracks out. I wasn't even, you know, really going up and talking to them or anything. It's just here, here's something to read while you're sitting there. And we got done with lunch and walked, it, you know, the whole length of the quick shop it was like a, you know, sandwich shop and then big quick shop, shop kind of thing. We're all the way at the other end of the store at the quick shop. And this guy comes up and says, can I talk to you? He says, can you explain this to me? You know? And he got saved right there, standing there in the quick shop. His heart was ready. We didn't do anything. We're Balaam's donkey. We're just given a message of repentance like Balaam's donkey. Right? Turn. But if we don't speak, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. And I think it's in Ezekiel. There's some verses about the blood. If you don't warn them, the blood is on your hands. Yeah, I don't, I mean, think how many people we haven't shared the gospel with we could have. It crushes me. How do you reconcile that? Like, you know, I'm an intruder, I have co-workers, mm -hmm. they know I'm a Christian, I have shared my faith in the gospel with a few of them, but not, since I'm in fact not all of them. Uh -huh. How do I, after working with them for two years, how do I come back and share the gospel? You, you pray that God gives you open doors and the people he gives you open doors, you do. And there's some people you just don't get a chance. I mean, I, I have the same thing. You know, in a work setting, you can't really just run around desk to desk, handing out tracts and preaching. But as God gives you opportunities, certainly do it. Other questions? Always carry tracts. Midtown's got 5,000 of them right now. We buy them 5,000, literally 5,000, 5,000 at a time as often as we need them. I, I usually pick up four every day and put them in my pocket. Some days I don't give any out. Some days I have to go back to, my cars are stashed full of them. Some days I have to go back to my car and get more. You know, if you're out, think of, think of your Saturday errands. You got to go to the grocery store. You got to go to Home Depot. You got to go here and you, you can have an opportunity to give the gospel to quite a few people without even trying. We have to be aware. And if you don't pray, it just doesn't work. I mean, my wife one time looked at me and goes, people just seem to want to talk to you about this. I go, mean, yeah, I pray about it a lot. And she prays for me when I'm sharing the gospel and the same with you guys. 
one of you gets to share the gospel with somebody, the other group, whoever's with you, just step off to the side and pray if you're not there helping. Get God, get God, you know, start talking to God and get God's attention and say, hey, you got to save this guy. You know, pray for your friend that's to have the right words. Pray for the person to be convicted. Pray for the blindness to be removed. Pray for, you know, them to truly accept Jesus Christ. Any other questions? You are going to miss people. There's going to be opportunities that you have to share or there's times you'll share and they'll have said something and you'll walk away and say, oh, I should have said this. Just live with it. That happens. That doesn't mean you don't go to the next one. You probably moved them up some stairs. That's the key. But, there, you know, that happens. There's, there's chances that you'll get a, a phenomenal wide open door and blow it. Just say, sorry, God, give me another. He knows us. We're weak. Um, you know, don't be scared. Nobody's ever beat me up. Nobody's ever done anything evil. You can get some people to say some harsh things once in a while. You walk away. They're, they're done. God just needs to work on them. Some of the harshest kids in the detention center are the ones that got saved, though. That's what's interesting. Over time, God works. It's a, you preach to a bunch of, and these are all, the kids that are in that detention center are all people who did violent crime. It's murder, rape, aggravated assault is primarily the things that they're in there for. They're, they're, they're the bad kids. The, other, the kids that are doing shoplifting and that stuff get ankle bracelets. But these are the tough kids. You get a room of 12 or so of those, and you, you think, oh, this guy's pretty soft and this guy and these guys, no way. You'll be totally wrong. You can't guess. Generally, witnessing to groups, God can work. God can save groups like that college group up there at Laramie, things like that. Don't hesitate. But a lot of times it only takes one in that group to be the, the heckler or the distractor that kind of blows it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but you know, if you get your chance, you know, ones and twos are where you get the good conversations usually. And younger rather than older. I mean, I hate to be a respecter of persons, but like if I'm going to cash the cash registers at Target or something, and there's a high school kid running one and an 80-year-old lady running the other one, I go to the high school kid. That's just me. That's where I see more fruit. You know, that doesn't mean I'm not happy to share with whoever I can, but if I get a choice, the younger ones, the ones that you know, by the time people are 30, their heart's getting kind of hard. And by the time they're, they're much older, unless they're dealing with, you know, life-threatening, oh, I just got diagnosed with cancer kind of stuff, you know, it gets harder and harder as people get older. But don't ever turn your back on somebody that, that God puts in front of you. That's it. Um, you know, certainly you, you keep them the way you want them is a true statement. We are commanded to give the gospel to everybody. Somebody who gets saved and never gets into church is still not burning in hell and is still going to give God glory forever. Don't think that is a bad thing, but it is only a third of the Great Commission. The best way to win people are your friends, your coworkers, your family, who will come to your house for Bible study, who will get comfortable with you and will come to church and plug in and become a disciple. The number of people that you win on the street, just, you know, just cold evangelism that actually come to church is fairly tiny. There's been some. There's been kids that we've won to the Lord out at Santa Caligon that came, I want to be baptized. Okay, we'll do that. But, it, but compared to the number who actually, you know, appear to accept, it's smaller. But we also know there's a lot of people even in our church that got saved at a young age through some way. And then God called them and plugged them into our church, you know, just almost by accident, just like, wow, here you are. Here's your purpose in life. Also think about this. Are you spending your life trying to be happy or joyful? Happy is usually based on you being blessed by others or by other stuff. Joy is, is rejoicing in what God's done through you. When you're 90 years old on your deathbed and you look back on your life, you're not going to say, boy, I wish I'd spend more time at the office making more money. Boy, I wish I'd bought that one more car. Boy, I wish my house had three more rooms in it. But you're going to look back and say, 
What did I do that's eternal? What did my own kids grow up to be? And what did my, my Christian kids grow up to be? And no matter how bad a day you're having, you can have joy. I can have joy in my disciples. I can have joy in all the people I've been, been honored and blessed to teach. That's eternal. That's forever. On my worst day, that's what I'm going to be thinking about. I'm not going to be thinking about, you know, did I get a Ferrari? There's nothing wrong with those things. What's your life focused on? Because it'll change your attitude towards this. You focused on joy or on happiness? And there's overlap. You even look up all the Bible verses of one and the other. There's overlap. But think about that. Are you trying to make God happy or are you happy? Because in the end, making God happy has a whole lot better outcome for you. But typically, what we also see is people who are diehard servants of God, he, he can bless them with some pretty cool stuff too. Any other questions? Every day, pick up some tracks and go give them to people and ask them, hey, do you know? And some people you don't get a chance to talk to, just give them a track. People get saved from tracks. Any questions? Um, the Eastern religions are hard. Um, if you get to, around here especially, you're going to see a lot of Indian students. Indian students are... India's... Mm, 75, 80% Hindu, 20% Buddhist, and 3% Christian. Hindus believe in lots of gods. And what you're going to find out is they'll take, take your Jesus and they'll put them on the shelf with their other 200 gods. You have to be real careful there. Um, Buddhists are tough. Buddhists are very tough because they, they don't, they really don't get sin. They don't understand sin. It's hard to get conviction. I know this one kid, we, we preached and talked to him and made friends with him and loved him in the detention center for, heck, he was in there probably nine months. And finally, one day, he got it and got saved. It's just like, man, we were all praying for him. It was, I mean, it was like, wow, how can it take so long? I mean, hearing a gospel message every week, taking stuff back and reading it, trying and in the end, what was really holding his back is, what's my family going to think? But he finally got saved. He'll be in heaven with us. So they're hard. They're, they're, it's more difficult. Some parts of the country are harder than others. New England, it's tough. Where Mike is, Mike and Meredith, that's a tough ground. Um, I, I was a part of a little company here that got by a bigger company. Um, they had a giant factory in Providence. It's just south of Boston. I went up there one week a month for several years. I don't think I won anybody to the Lord there in Providence in the whole time I was there. On the planes and airports on the way, yeah, maybe. I don't think, there, and I even stayed in the same hotel so I could make friends with the people and really connect. And I mean, I knew people first name basis. Oh, hi, Larry, you're back again, blah, 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 blah. That's tough. Then you go down to Dallas, it's the opposite. Everybody will talk to you about the gospel. 90% of them think they're saved. and I don't know, probably 50% really are and aren't doing anything with it. <laughs> it's the inverse. So you, you see that culturally, it's different. You know, there's areas that are harder than others. You know, James going to Pakistan, how many people did he win to the Lord? Oh my goodness. But he took a whole bunch and maybe moved them up a step or two steps, or three steps. God will use that. That's not a failure. Anything else? It's probably more than half an hour. No, thank you so much. Uh, this is great. It really clears up a lot of, like, I guess, um, I don't know, silliness with evangelism. I think sometimes it can be, like, this, you know, thing we put up on a pedestal that's really hard for us to do. Yes. So when talking to people, you're inviting them to different things, like food or home. Um, what's the most common way you like serving them for discretion? Where do you want to invite them? 
Um, it's kind of who they are and where you are and what they're doing. Um, recently, I've talked to two different Muslim couples at the grocery store in Shawnee. And what I did is I got their phone number and hooked them up with Wagi. I know most of the Kaya stuff is, hey, come over to my house, come over to our Bible study and just hang out because that age group's so relational and they're not the least bit afraid about going to some stranger's house as long as there's more people like them there, right? Um, we're doing something now. We've just started um, a marriage Bible study at our house. And what we're doing is having marriage cu married couples come over and we're taking a topic each, each month and talking about marriage. And it's not a hardcore Bible study, but we're putting the Bible verses in. But we're talking about, okay, what's the problem? You know, what's going on in people's lives because of the problem? What's the Bible say about it? Okay, what are suggestions? And we're going to use that to try to bring in married couples. Um, that, that age group from the time they get married, you know, on up gets hard to do relational stuff with. The first topic of our marriage series was how to make time for your marriage in your marriage. Because people are just so busy, they neglect their marriage. They don't spend time. They don't keep doing what brought them together. Their marriages fall apart. So we're doing that as a way to try to kind of reach that. We're going to meet two, two times a month at our house. Um, we started last month. And so that's just kind of a different, you know, it's a different hook to throw into the ocean and see. And it also helps our own people. Nita and I are very dedicated to helping with the marriages in our church. Mostly because when we got married, we got married, then we got saved. We were a mess. We were party animal crazy. And now we're saved and we had no idea what to do. And we didn't really have anybody that was willing to help us. We went to two different pastors, got kind of quick fix things. What we needed was somebody to disciple us and what it was to be a Christian and, and a married couple as Christians. So we're kind of trying to take that role. God's just laid that on our heart. But whatever works and different people are going to need different things. Sports is huge. Sporting events, you know, yeah. You know, invite them to invite them to play soccer, invite them to play frisbee, invite them to play whatever. You know, whatever you want to do. But just whatever you think will connect. Make friends with them. You want them to be disciples. What would you do if this guy was soon to be your best friend? Or girl or whatever. And one of the one of the greatest frustrations I have is God gave me a gift to share the gospel. I'm not very good at the invitation part of it. You know, it's frustrating as many people, you know, seemingly as hear the gospel and how few we can really get plugged into church. That's my big, big, you know, weakness. You know, God fills the spiritual buckets. I didn't get the gift of invitation. <laughs> but I go out with other people who do. Anything else? Kind of took up most of our daylight time. It was good. It was actually good. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Most people are more than willing to talk. You know, there'll be two or three out of 10 that won't. The rest will talk, you know, and, and a few of those are going to be really serious and that's what you're looking for. So cast that net. Well, will we pray for our Bible study? Absolutely. I'll pray for all of you. And you're all invited to hit the streets first week of every month, first Saturday of every month. And we go out on the street and talk to people. And you can do the same here. Your Bible study can go out. Go out to Loose, yeah, go out to Loose Park. Go out just around UMKC, you know, whatever. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We know evangelism is your heart, Lord. You are the greatest evangelist of all time who came down to save us, Lord. And we just pray for every man here, Lord, that your power is with him like you promised in the Great Commission. We pray that they fear you more than they fear their own, own what people would think about them, Lord. We, we pray, Lord, that they take it seriously every single day of their life, not just on, on ministry days, not just on special event days, but every single day. Look for those opportunities. Leave the house praying for people to be saved, Lord and then looking for those opportunities to speak. And please, when they do, Lord, give them fruit. Give them enormous fruit. Let them practice doing it often enough that they're good at it, Lord. 
and that they bring many, many, many to your kingdom. And we just pray, Father, if, if I can help in any way, if, if anyone else in our church can help, let them get the help they need. But please, Lord, let your kingdom be glorified by people spreading the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To tell you how bad gospel sharing is in this country, think about this. This country was founded on the First Amendment, which is the right of free speech, and one of the things specifically they were after was the ability to hand out religious tracts, to share different religions. The Second Amendment was put in to protect the First Amendment from the government taking over, because they all came out of countries that had a specific religion, England, the Church of England, you know, Irish were Catholic. You know, everybody had their country religion and it was all but forced on them. This country was founded with the first two parts specifically to be able to share the gospel. Now tell me something. How many people have just come up and shared the gospel with you in the last five years out on the street? How many in your lifetime? A country that was founded on the specific purpose of being able to share the gospel by the Christian forefathers. And don't go into all the details. Yes, some of them believed in baptism and a bunch of other stuff, but they fought for this. They were willing to cross an ocean on a teeny tiny boat for this. How many Christians are sharing the gospel now? In my life, I think... There's been three people that have shared the gospel. One guy was at the big coffee house, coffee center there in DFW Airport's Terminal C. And he was actually a Seventh-day Adventist, so he wanted to argue more about why he didn't go to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. Um, but he was. There was a guy at Fanuel Hall in Boston when I was just kind of sightseeing one of the times I was up there. And he was literally sitting at a, a little table he brought with him out of outside Fanuel Hall is like one of the places they wrote the Constitution or something. I don't remember the exact thing. But he was out there sharing the gospel. And one guy on 39th Street by the pizza place was walking down the street when we were out sharing the gospel. And we went up. I just saw him and I kind of knew. And I just went up to him and he, he, he's, he's like, I was like, I was like well, what you doing? He's like, I'm sharing the story of Jesus. You know, are you sure you're going to heaven? Tell me about that. See, I didn't lie. I didn't say yes or no. Tell me about that. And he really did. It was, he was from Macedonia or somewhere. Real live evangelist in the streets of Midtown. I witnessed to some people at Santa Caligon last weekend when we went there who turned around and said, we're out here doing the same thing right as we were leaving. But think about it. This country was founded for the right to do that. It ought to be happening every day. Never. But the fields are white for harvest. So I got a question. Uh, I um, so, I guess, how do we, what, I guess, you know, I think it's always helpful to hear from like, different people what the Bible says about how to fight against uh, lukewarmness. About uh, lukewarmness. Uh huh. Yeah. Lukewarmness is really people who aren't lukewarm, but they turn on once in a while and the rest of the time they're turned off. The question is who you're going to live your life for. Are you a full-time servant of God or not? And that's really what it comes down to. And it's also dedication. Look what God did for you. Don't you owe him something? Don't you want that for all the people around you? I mean, doesn't it hurt to know that your next door neighbor is going to hell forever? I mean, that ought to be a burden. So that's what I'd say. It's, it's our duty. It's, our, it, it's, it's a habit. It's just like getting up in the morning and reading your Bible. Your flesh doesn't want to do it, but your spirit does. Your soul needs it. 
you know, do I want to go out and talk to people about the gospel? Yes, I do now. Do you know why? Once you start leading people to the Lord, you feel like, wow, God is using me. This is what I'm here for. Once you start seeing God work through you, it's miraculous. You forget about what people are saying. Who are you going to please? Some dude you're never going to see again or God? By the foolishness of preaching, the Bible says. But you have to humble yourself as a servant of the Lord. And don't think I'm perfect at it either. I mean, there's people, I mean, there's times that you just think, oh, this guy's never, doesn't want to hear this or whatever. I mean, Satan will try to talk you out of it. Just go on to the next one. You blow it once, there's, there's a, what, 8 billion people in the world today? Make sure they all hear it. So don't be lukewarm. Because what that means is you're turned off most of the time. That's what a lukewarm person really is. I'll shut up now. <laughs> You're running out of memory. <laughs> Take tracks, use them. I brought a bunch. Church has literally 5,000 right now. We just got them. That's, we buy them that many at a time. And I bet, I'm not bragging, I bet I go through 800 to 1,000 a year myself. We probably did use 50 at Santa Caligon in one night. Shouldn't that be all of us? I mean, think about it, 100 tracks a month. Think about what 100 tracks a month means, three a day. Three a day? Is that too much to ask? And there's days you get don't get any, but there's days you go to Santa Caligona, there's probably 50 people for each one of us that went there. You go to Loose Park and do 20 or 30. And the goal isn't just to give them the track, it's to give them the power of God and the, the story, if they'll hear it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry I talked so long. Oh, but, no. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Evangelize. Do you want to see this?